are going to be dealing with the Word of God, let's bow our hearts. Father, we praise you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for this opportunity. We pray, Father, that you would guard our thoughts and words, that they would be effective for you and your purposes. We pray, Father, that it might be the blessing that you designed it to be. But in all these things, we commit it into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're exploring a topic that is often avoided and is fraught with all kinds of controversies. And, uh, but we'll just jump right into it. The origin of evil is the topic, and this is part one of a two-part study. We'll start by exploring a little bit the famous temptations of Christ. Most of you are familiar with the, the text. Satan tempted Christ in three areas, making stone into bread, and that's recorded in Luke 4 and Matthew 4. It's recorded in the two Gospels, both Luke 4 and Matthew 4. This, another one was the kingdoms of the world, again recorded in both Luke 4 and Matthew 4, and taking Jesus to, to the pinnacle of the temple, and that is also in Luke 4 and Matthew 4. The, the, rec, the accounts are virtually identical in all three uh, or all three of these in both Gospels. In, they happen to be in a slightly different order in one of them. But uh, let's just take a look at the text to begin with here. We'll take the, I'll use the Luke account as our base text here. Luke 4, verse 1, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. In other words, this happens right after his baptism. So he returns from the Jordan was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. I might add the word understandably. <laughs> a fast is tough enough for a few days, a few weeks. Forty days is a substantial commitment. And this is an absolute fast, apparently. Not the, some of us fast with an intermediate kind of fast, but this is, uh, this is a, a for real fast. He did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it may be made bread. I think we understand who he is. We know that he could snap his fingers and have a whole bakery there. That was the temptation, though, wasn't it? And Jesus answered and said, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So it's interesting that in each of these three temptations, Jesus always responds with the word of God. That should be a lesson for all of us. Then we get to the second one here in Luke. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Quite a proposition. Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then we get to the third one. And he, the devil, brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. And I might mention the if thou be, it's a, it's a uh, it, it could be translated since. That. It's not, there's no ambiguity as to whether he is or isn't. It's a since thou, not a if in sense of being in a conditional. Anyway. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from thence. For it is written, He shall give His angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. One of the sub-lessons uh, sub here is Satan never hesitates to quote Scripture. He's quoting Scripture here. But Jesus answering him said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So again, Jesus rebuts it with his quote from Scripture. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. 
only for a season. So this, this is a very familiar passage to most of us, the temptations of Christ, the Matthew account being essentially parallel uh, to all of this. Let's go back and examine a little more closely the second of these three. In Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 5, And the devil, taking up to a high mountain, showed him unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. It's hard for us to visualize that happening, and yet we can imagine it. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. I want you to notice this. He showed them all the kingdoms of the world, not most of them, all of them. It says, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. So we've got the kingdoms, the power, and the glory. This is exactly what we pray for in the Lord's Prayer. But whose are they in the Lord's Prayer? God's. So what's going on here? Are they His yet? Apparently not. The devil, says, the devil says, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. That's Satan's boast. If that boast is vacuous, there's no temptation involved. If I said to you, I want to sell you the Brooklyn Bridge, you're not tempted because you know I don't own it. If I said, I'm going to sell you the Coeur d'Alene Resort for a five-star golf resort, you're not tempted because you know I don't own that. See, in order for this to be a temptation, the claim has to be legitimate. Does Satan have a legitimate claim to the kingdom's power and glory that he's talking about here? Apparently does. Jesus Christ doesn't challenge his possession. This is an offer by the owner. The Lord rejected Satan's offer, but not because he didn't recognize his ownership. Christ knew that Satan did have these kingdoms. Let's get that, let's really grasp that to start with. Ultimately, of course, Christ will rule over the kings of the world, but not as some kind of vice regent under Satan, of course. But today, we need to understand the devil is still the prince of the power of the air. He's the one who is in the back of the kingdoms of our world, whether we recognize it or not. Satan's title is prince of this world in John 12. The prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2, too. Head of the world rulers of darkness in Ephesians 6. The God of this age, Paul calls him in second, in second letter to the Corinthians. These are just a few of the titles that the Word of God applies to Satan. So he's powerful. So that raises the issue that we want to explore a little bit. And that's, see, we know that the angels, Satan's an angel, right? Originally, he is, he's a fallen angel, whatever you want to call it. We know that the angels were created before the earth. We probably don't focus on that unless you're just interested in that area, but clearly in Job, let's take a look at the oldest book of the Bible, Job 38. There's a science quiz at the end of Job called chapter 38. And in, that, in the Word of God, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, and then he goes on with a number of questions. God is responding to the whole, these 40 chapters of dialogue, putting up his questions. God's asking the questions here. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Sounds like one of our college professors. Anyway, gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. God speaking here. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. God is challenging man's wisdom here. He's challenging it. He goes on and says, Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? And who hath stretched a line upon it? Here's God challenging a man in his, in his audacity to even have any opinions about the origin of the earth. He wasn't around. That's what God is saying. Where were you when I was doing all these things, in other words? Continuing, Whereupon are the foundations thereof made to sink? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Let's get behind this phrase. The sons of God is the English translation of a Hebrew word, Benai Ha Elohim, which is 
a term in the Old Testament used exclusively of angels. We could, we could track that all the way through. But the, the term Benai Elohim refers to a direct creation of God. And what we've, that's used of Adam was a direct creation of God. His offspring are not direct creations of God. They're, direct, they're de- descendants of Adam. Big difference. The other direct creation of God called, are, are, are these angels. And that's, that's why that term is used. In the New Testament, it speaks of the Messiah coming. He came into his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. A, a direct creation, a born again. That's what John chapter 1, verse 11, 12. So there's no doubt about that use. In fact, the Septuagint translation from the Hebrew into the Greek uses the word angels. There should be no ambiguity in your mind as to what that term means. What that tells you in that verse, verse 7 of Job 38, is that the angels were able to sing and celebrate the creation of the earth. That means they were created earlier. Are we together so far? Okay. But notice what Job, the passage of Job continues after that. Or who shut up the sea with the doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of a womb? When did that happen? When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, in thick darkness a swaddling band for it, or established my decree upon it, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. And here shall thy pride of thy waves be stayed. wonder what it's talking about here. God continues here. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? What's God talking about here? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment, and from the wicked their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. Well, you can regard some of this language as just being poetic language in broad brush, or maybe it's alluding to something very specific. An original creation and then a judgment. Possibly. Possibly. See, we know the angels were created before the earth was, Well, Satan was an angel. We first find Satan in Genesis chapter 3 already fallen. Adam Adam and Eve got their comeuppance in Genesis 3. Satan had already fallen by Genesis 3. The question that lurks behind the text is when when did Satan fall? We know from things that we'll look at here in a few minutes that he was numero uno. He was the angel in charge of all the other angels. He was top guy with, among the angels. And he, re, and he got, usurped his authority and he got judged. When did that happen? It had to happen before Genesis 3. It couldn't happen before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. That's the beginning of everything. In beginning, not in the beginning, in beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And that's an all-inclusive phrase. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. So the questions are, when did Satan fall, and how did he gain his position of power that we experienced in the temptation, among other places? We're dealing here with the cosmos. We're thinking of the universe in its broad strokes. Puny man finds himself in the middle of this universe. Let's take size going to the right. As we, we're going to look at things bigger than man, we'll call that the cosmos. We're going, to ex- we're going to expand in the direction of largeness from man to the earth to the solar system to the universe, whatever. That's the field of science we call astronomy or astrophysics. That's the macrocosm, the large side of things. The great discovery of 20th century science is they've discovered that the universe is not infinite. It's finite. It has a limit. That's what leads to all these conjectures about the Big Bang, because it has a limit and it had a beginning. And it's maybe expanding. There's all kinds of conjectures, but we're dealing here in the bigness side of things, okay? I want to talk just for a moment, before we get into the truth of God's Word, let's try to shed the baggage of our presuppositions. One of the things that encumbers our understanding in many areas 
is when we bring to a subject some preconceptions, especially if they're incorrect. I want to talk for a moment about what's called the nebular hypothesis. If you take any course in college or high school in astronomy, you'll encounter a thing called the nebular hypothesis. Where did the planets come from? And there's a modern myth that is taught in textbooks and in, sc in school, which is not true, but widely taught. I want to call our attention to this, the nebular hypothesis. It runs something like this, and I'm quoting from Immanuel Kant, one of the classic expressions of this hypothesis. Some four billion years ago, the sun had ejected a tail or a filament of material that cooled and collected and thus formed the planets. That's a summary that you'll find in many different ways in many different textbooks taught today in college. But I'm quoting here from Immanuel Kant himself. Actually, he didn't invent this idea. 21 years earlier, it was published by Immanuel Swedenborg. It was published in Latin in 1734. Now, Swedenborg, you need to understand, was a very wise, a guy with a lot of broad interests, an engineer with many interests, who claimed to have psychic powers. And he got this idea in a seance, apparently, or some such thing. He claimed this was confirmed by the nebular hypothesis in seances with men on Jupiter, Saturn, and places more distant. Are you getting a little suspicious of this idea? I hope so. Some 20 years earlier, in 1712, Swedenborg was then 24 years old, and he happened to have an opportunity to visit with Edmund Halley, a very famous astronomer at Cambridge, and who, Halley, very famous for his predictions about comets and so forth. So Swedenborg trafficked with these kinds of people and those kinds of ideas. In, in that same era, Pierre Simon Laplace, a very reputable mathematician, lent his endorsement to Kant's theory, but without checking the mathematical validations that he was capable of doing. He didn't bother to check the math. Laplace didn't. Therefore, Kant, who picked this up from Swedenborg, it became considered valid, widely taught, and is to this day. And it's not true, by the way. Provably not true. And what's tragic is Laplace had the depth and mathematics he could have, if he'd done his homework, refute this thing back then. But anyway, the nebular hypothesis gained widespread respectability despite it's got very serious mathematical problems. And subsequent writers have continued to develop variations of this idea, even though the more they study it, the more it becomes obvious that it can't be true. And I'll show you why. I'm reminded, I couldn't resist putting this in here, I'm reminded of uh, Through the Looking Glass, Glass by uh, Lewis Carroll. One can't believe impossible things, a Alice laughed. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> and of course, Lewis Carroll is poking fun here, but it fits the foolishness that we uh, uh, proliferate through our textbooks and our educational system. The difficulty, the sun turns out, to have 99.86% of the mass of the solar system. If you take the total solar system, almost, not 100%, but almost 100% of the mass is in the sun. It's huge compared to the planets and so forth. And yet, the sun contains only less than 2% of the angular momentum. It has all the mass, but not the spin. The nine planets contain 98% of the spin, the momentum. The more you think about that, the more absurd it is. You got most of the mass is not spinning. All the, the, the momentum is, the energy, moment, the momentum energy is in, uh, in the uh, orbits. There is no plausible explanation that would support a solar origin of the planets. The planets did not come out of the sun. They were brought here and got caught by it. James Jeans, again, a, a, a classic mathematician, point out that the outer planets are far larger than the inner ones. That's hard to explain. Why are the larger ones, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the ones that are outside larger? Jupiter is almost 6,000 times as massive as Mercury. It's almost 3,000 times as massive as Mars and so forth. There's all, and this is also a difficult, you, you try to come up with some theory how that happened, you, you, you find yourself contradicting yourself. There are other enigmas. The planets are here in three pairs. There are three pairs of 
rapid spin rates among our planets, each of which are within 3% of the other, of its, of its mate. They're almost, they're almost exactly the same spins. Why? We have uh, Earth and Mars spin almost at the same speed. Jupiter and Saturn almost exactly at the same speed. Neptune and Uranus. Why is this? Nobody knows. It implies that they came in pairs somehow. Earth and Mars also have identical spin axis tilts. The axis of their spin match. Why? It implies something, but not conclusively. From the angular momentum and the orbital calculations, it is deemed by many of the scientists that these, these planets came in pairs and were brought here by some other object. Something else caught them, came close, and it capped the orbit. You have to get into the orbital mechanics to really try to dramatize that. But there's more to it than that. Why does Mars have 93% of its craters in one hemisphere and 7% in the other? As we explore the planets with NASA probes, they have all, they're all pockmarked. By the way, you quickly, one thing you quickly discover is our solar system is a rough neighborhood. It's been beat up really badly, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But Mars has 93% of its craters on one side and only 7% on the other. In fact, it would seem that 80% of these craters occurred within a single half hour. Term that because it's spinning all while this is going on, right? Why is that? Nobody knows. These raise legitimate scientific questions. The planet Mars is the fourth planet from the sun. It's named after the Roman god of war, not by accident. Most of the early civilizations on the planet Earth were terrified of the planet Mars. Why? We regard ourselves as sophisticated space-age people, right? Could you go out in the night sky and point to Mars tonight? Only if you're an astronomer or have an ephemeris. I'm an astronomer, have any, but I, I, had a tough, I wouldn't be sure. I'd have to do a little homework to be sure what I'm looking at. Mars is the bale of the Old Testament. Why? Why were they so terrified of Mars? You need to understand that science people who indulge in these kinds of studies fall into two groups. There are uniformitarianism, and the, that's the majority of people. They cling to the presumption that things have remained essentially unchanged over billions of years. Most scientists presume that whatever's true today was true billions of years ago. They're called uniformitarianisms. There are scientists that see, feel just the opposite. They're called catastrophists. They believe the universe has not always been the same. It's been subjected to a series of catastrophic events. And the evidence of those catastrophes are in what we see. And we try to infer what's happened. And, and people who believe in creationism would fall into that category, by the way. If you're a fiat creationist, and I assume most of you may be, then you would be in that second category. Back in June 30th of 1908, in Tunguska, central Siberia, there was an impact of some kind of meteor. It's very famous. It destroyed 2,000 square miles of forest. It was so remote from civilization, it wasn't explored until 17 years after the fact. 1925. It is a, it, whatever happened there is equivalent to a 15 megaton nuclear warhead, to give you a rough feeling of disaster here. If you know the Winslow crater in Arizona, you're familiar, it's one mile across, and there are, other, there are others of these uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula, one six mile in diameter, a hundred megaton equivalent. There have been things that have impacted the earth. That's the whole point I'm making here. In fact, scientists estimate that it happens about uh, one every 300 years, and one in three of these are on land, the rest land in the ocean. But they still continue. That may surprise many people. There's a meteorite uh, in Mecca that created the Kaaba that the Muslims worship. The word Cairo in Egyptian is the Arabic word for Mars. That may surprise you. That's the site of the Great Pyramid, not by accident. In Athens, the word in Greek, Ares is Mars. It's pictured as a source of judgment. Aragopolis, Mars Hill. Why is Mars always associated with war? There's a reason for that we've come to. And uh, take a look at any surface in our solar system. You get plenty of opportunity to see NASA photographs of any of the planets. You'll always notice, look at our moon. Get a pair of binoculars. Take a look at our own moon. Everything you find in the solar system has got pockmarks from being beat up. 
our solar system is a rough neighborhood. We are under a constant rain of interplanetary debris on the Earth, about 100 tons of extraterrestrial material per day. Over 100 creators on the Earth. It may surprise you. Well, in the Bible, we find an interesting event called the sun stood still in, in, in the book of Joshua. We, know, we now know that the ancient calendars, all of them, were based on 360-day years. All ancient calendars, most of them have 12, 30-day months somehow in their basic structure. But in 701 B.C., they all change. Calendars earlier than 701 are 360 days. Subsequent, they change. They do all different kinds of things. The Jews add a month every three years, sort of. Not quite. The Romans added four and a quarter days per year and so forth. It's interesting that Mars was worshipped by the ancient cultures. There is a theory that's been surprisingly validated that Mars made near passbys the planet Earth. You see, they believe now, in what they know about orbital mechanics, that Earth and Mars originally were on resonant orbits. 360 days for the Earth, 720 for Mars. But they were in such a way that they made a near pass by every 108 years. And those are recorded on the planet Earth, by the way. And this would account for catastrophic events that we have records of on a number of occasions in history. Energy transfers apparently stabilized in 71 BC, and that's what stabilized the calendars. And by the way, to make the sun stand still, you don't have to stop the spin of the Earth. All you have to do is change its precession would cause the same effect. So the idea of the Earth being on a 360-day orbit, Mars on a 720-day orbit originally, but pass by twice a year. Not every year, every 108 years it turns out. There's a resonant orbit, Earth 360, Mars 720. When they, when they had a near pass, uh, near uh, uh, a uh, 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 in the spring, March 20th, 21st, it would pass on the inside after perihelion, that is where it's the closest. Uh, it would be ahead and lose energy. Earth would gain a little, Mars would lose a little. If, the, uh, if it was aphelion, furthest away from the sun, it would be outside, passing behind the Earth, Earth losing a little, Mars gaining a little. Always a little adjustment. And that finally stabilized in 71 B.C., that's a theory. I'm not going to give you the whole length of it except to indicate that the stabilization resulted in the Earth being 365 and a quarter days where it finally stabilized and Mars 720 dropped down to 687 where it is today. Now, this, may sound, this theory has a great deal. If you're interested in this, you want to get into our Joshua background because it has a great deal to say about it. But the, the surprising thing is is that this seems to have been validated by Jonathan Swift. You say, how? What are you talking about? John Swift wrote some children's stories called Gulliver's Travels. Yes, he did. Early telescopes. In 1610, Galileo developed his telescope and he discovered the four moons of Jupiter and Saturn's ring. Big deal in 1610. Herschel, 1781, with a better telescope, discovers the planet Uranus. Big deal. Six years later, Herschel discovers the two moons of Uranus. Big deal. 1789, a couple of years later, he finds two more moons of Uranus. See, our skill with telescopes was improving. 1846, Lavier discovered Neptune and one of its moons. 1877, a guy by the name of Ace of Hall, using a brand new telescope at the U.S. Naval Observatory, makes history by discovering with his new telescope the two moons of Mars. And he names them Deimos and Phobos. Why? was it so hard to find? Because they're only eight miles across and they're almost black. They have an albedo, a reflectivity of less than 3%. So they're hard to find. But they were able, Ace of Hall discovers it in 1877. And they're very unusual because one of them is going backwards. Everything in the solar system goes in one direction. One of these happens to go backwards. It, uh, it's, and Deimos, it's almost a synchronous orbit, 30 hours and 18 minutes uh, uh, orbit. And uh, Phobos is the one that goes backwards, eastward, if you will. And it's only 8 miles in diameter. It has a reflectivity of only 3%, albedo. Well, why am I getting into this? Get the date, 1877, we discover the two moons of Mars, right? A guy by the name of Jonathan Swift, an Irish political commentator, wrote a series of stories that were supposed to be political satire, we know them as children's stories, called Gulliver's Travels. Okay. 
Now, he published that in 1726. Most of us know the first voyage of Gulliver with the little people, the Lilliputians. The third voyage of Gulliver is a story you may not have read where they go to Laputa. And the astronomers in this particular uh, venue brag that they know about the two moons of Mars and the astronomers in London don't know anything about it. And in the story, the size, the revolutions, and the orbits of those two moons of Mars are specified within 20% accuracy. And the fact that one of them is going backwards. Now that turns out to be bizarre because Jonathan Swift wrote his children's story 151 years before the astronomical world discovered it. Did Jonathan Swift know that? No, of course not. He apparently drew upon some legends that it, to embroider his story, not knowing that those legends apparently had their origin in eyewitness accounts, because there were no telescopes that could see it in those days. This turns out to be a shocking corroboration of the near pass-by hypothesis, 151 before years before. So the whole idea, all I'm getting across here is to understand that our solar system is subject to shocks that the astronomical world has closed their eyes to, pretty much. And you, you all know the story of the long day of Joshua. Mars comes up on a polar pass at about 70,000 miles away from us, appears to rise from the horizon 50 times the size of the moon. There's earthquakes, land tides, a polar shift of 5 degrees, so that makes the day longer. Meteors follow two to three hours later at 30,000 miles per hour. And all this kind of thing is embodied in other people's legends. The long day in China is offsetting the long day in the Middle East, by the way. Enough of this. Let's get back to what we know is true. That's all just presented so you'll stretch your horizons here a little bit. There is a theory called the gap theory, and there's two kinds of people that deal with the gap theory, those that dismiss it as nonsense or those that misapply it. We're going to try to do neither. You're going to do, all I want to do is understand, help you understand why some of us hold the view that there's an interval before, before, in between the first two verses of the book of Genesis. Okay? Now, some... When were the angels created? When did Satan fall? Is there a gap? In the, that's the issues before us this, in this hour. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. If you accept that statement, you will have absolutely no problem with any other verse in the Bible. That says it all. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. Done deal. No contest. The next verse says, And the earth was without form and void, Darkness is upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let light be. And there was light. And God saw the light and it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were day one. Now we could spend a lot, we spend a whole hour on this in our Genesis commentary. I'll spare you all that. But I want to focus our attention on that second verse because its translation isn't precise. And there, this is one of those times when precision may be our rescue here. It says, And the earth was without form and void. When we get to Isaiah, we find a strange phrase here. In verse 18 of 45, God says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain. That seems to contradict Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The earth was without form and void. But God says, I didn't create it. You know, tohu. Tohu for bohu. Without form and void. He did create it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. There would seem to be a contradiction between Isaiah 45, 18 and Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Now, whenever you find an apparent contradiction in the Bible, rejoice. Because Behind that will lie a discovery. It's what a, a rabbi would call a remez, a hint of something deeper. Let's look further. When we get to Jeremiah, we find some strange descriptions here that don't seem to, they're, they're, they're provocative. Jeremiah chapter 4, starting about verse 23. He says, I beheld the earth, and lo, 
it was without form and void. Really? And the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. Again, the word toho without form is here, toho vobohu, those two words that occur in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Jeremiah continues, I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord by His fierce anger. And thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. Gee, what's going on here? A judgment of some kind. Why isn't He making a full end? He must have some plan in mind. Well, let's go back here and let's take a look. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion was round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of skies. And the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens and the highest gave his voice hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of the waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of thy nostrils. Sounds like a cosmic judgment of some kind. Great. When did it happen? What historical event explains this? Or is it just flowery language is a poet getting carried away here? Well, let's take a closer look at verse 2 of Genesis and see if it holds the key to this riddle. The way it reads in your Bible likely is, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The word was turns out to be a transitive verb requiring action. It's the same verb that in Ch Genesis chapter 19, verse 26, is used when Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. It's a transitive verb requiring action. The earth became without form and void. Haya, had become. In fact, because of the word order and the structure, it's the pluperfect form. It had become without form and void. Now, without form, tohu, without form, confused, void, bohu, void, empty, waste, without form and void, tohu vabohu. Furthermore, there's this and up front. It's a vav, it's a conjunction, like and, except it turns out to be what we call an adversative conjunction, meaning it's not and, it's but. The vav conjunction, it's adversative. Both the Septuagint, the Greek translation 900 years before the Masoretic, and also the Latin Vulgate, both translate that as but in the English, equivalent to the but in the English. And by the way, that adversative conjunction often suggests a time delay. In Exodus 2, it is an eight-year period. In Deuteronomy 10, it represents a 38-year period. In 1 Chronicles 10, it's a seven-year period. In Ezekiel 6, it's a 58-year period. It's an adversative, but it implies a delay of some kind. So it's the way this gets translated properly is but the earth had become without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Something happened between verse 1 and verse 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. But the earth had become without form and void. And the Scripture is not silent about events that apparently fit into that interval, into that gap. And uh, we find this uh, Tova Bohu thing always used as an aftermath of judgment. Isaiah 34, Isaiah 45 that we looked at, Jer uh, Jeremiah 4 that we looked at. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. That isn't darkness like the absence of light. That's an unnatural darkness. It's called Korsek. It's in Exodus 10. In the, upon the face of the deep, the home, in the Greek, it's the abuso. 
the abyss. That's the home of the demons and the evil spirits. Well, now, wait a minute here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Fabulous. Something happened that the earth became without form and void, and now darkness on the face of the deep. And one of the hypotheses we want to explore, possibly this explains the judgment on a prior situation that was the judgment on a usurper. So the gap theory, this I thing I'm going to suggest to you was first suggested as near as we can tell by Thomas Chalmers in 1814. And you'll find books written about it. Perhaps the classic on this subject is George Pember's book, Earth's Earliest Ages, published in London in 1907. It's readily available in most bookstores. Donald Gray Barnhouse, The Invisible War, is one of my must-reads in my library. Fabulous, fabulous book on this whole subject. And Arthur uh, Custance, Without Form and Void, published in the 70s, and there has been others. Let's take a look at a chapter in the Bible that's just a treasure trove of insight in Ezekiel chapter 28. And because it, it, it deals with the power that's behind the throne, there it's dealing with the throne of Tyrus. Ezekiel 28, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, Ezekiel speaking, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. This guy, Tyrus, here called the prince of Tyrus, is an egomaniac. And in dealing with this egomaniac, the text goes beyond him to the power that's behind him. Here he's called the prince of Tyrus. That's the prince of Tyrus. He's an actual guy. But the text is going to switch to the king of Tyrus, the power that's behind him, as it goes here. We're first dealing with the prince of Tyrus. But he's a man. Thou art a man, not God. He thinks he's God. He's, a, he's deluded. I am a God. These, these, uh, this, this was the same thing that Isaiah uses of the king of Babylon. We're going to look at that in a minute, too. There are similar examples. The boast of Pharaoh Hophra in um, Ezekiel 29, the praise given to Herod Agrippa by the Tyrians in, uh, in Acts 12. Paul's description of the man of sin uses practically the same words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Remember he says, who, this, this is the Antichrist we call him, who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God. That includes Allah, by the way. Or that is worshipped. So he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. False pretender, of course. See, Tyre was known as the Holy Island. The city was thought of as rising from the waters like a rock throne of God. And uh, Genesis 3, 5, remember that uh, 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 God deals here, though thou set thy heart. The words remind us of the temptation uh, in Genesis 3. But let's go on here. In, in uh, Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel continue, God speak, speaking through Ezekiel, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches, and hast gotten gold and silver and thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches. Thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Some people, because they're rich, think they know. That's sort of the situation here. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy greatness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Will thou set yet set before him that, that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. You think you're a god. The guy that's cutting your head off isn't going to be too impressed. And Ethbel III was removed from his throne by Nebuchadnezzar back in 573 and so on. But now we're going to shift gears. The text goes on, but it talks about the power behind the prince of Tyre, the king of Tyre. Don't confuse the prince of Tyre in the first 11 verses with, and, and, and with the, the, that was an actual ruler, with the king of Tyre. Let's examine what God says through Ezekiel in the next um, uh, nine verses. The king, different word used, the melech, not the, not the nagid. Nagid is the tire, it was the first 11 verses. We're now going to talk about the melech, 
of the power behind them. The notice is it's actually changing subjects here. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God. Now notice what he says here. Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. It doesn't say he thinks he is. It says he is. He is the most beautiful thing available anywhere. Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, really, and perfect in beauty, the king of Tyrus. Thou sealest up the sum. He's the cat's meow, as some people might say. Okay, The language, although it's being applied to the king of Tyre, it's very similar to language we're going to see that God uses through Isaiah to the king of Babylon. We'll come to that later. And yet we see here an ulterior or fuller accomplishment in Satan and his embodiment in the Antichrist. You go through Daniel 7, 2 Thessalonians 2, and Revelation 13, you'll see this all fits together because Satan's man is, is described by these things too. Notice what, he's, the, the, what uh, God says in verse 13. Fabulous thing. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now this should be a red flag right there. You know that the king of Tyre wasn't in Eden. He's a mortal guy in the 6th century B.C. No, no, Eden, that's a bit back, huh? Thou hast been in Eden the garden. You suddenly realize the address he here is a spiritual being that's the power behind Tyre at the time. Thou hast been in Eden. And notice how he's dressed. Every precious stone was thy covering. I suspect that these precious stones we're going to be talking about here are the old-fashioned way of dealing with colored light. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. This is a created being, the ultimate created being, the number one created being in a sense, but he's a created being. Eden, of course, was where? On the earth. We're not talking heaven here. We're talking on the earth. Yet on the earth, he's clothed in light. Ooh. It may have been a different kind of earth than we think of. Every precious stone is that cover. It goes through all these different stones. Those stones are the same stones that emblazon the breastplate of the high priest. On the high priest, you remember the first stone and the last stone are stones, you know, are specific stones. The first is the sardius. It was the stone of Reuben, whose name means behold a son. And the last one is the jasper, which represents Benjamin, the son of my right hand. And they become the bookends of the 12 tribes, in a sense, okay? From the first to the last, okay? Both titles of Christ, of course. Behold a son, the son of my right hand. Who could that be? Who might be the, the ultimate tie, uh, uh, hold of that thing? And by the way, what's interesting here, nine precious stones here answer to 12 in the high priest breastplate. There are, there's one row that's missing in each. The third is omitted in the Masoretic, but it is in the Septuagint. So it seems to be something that was dropped out in the 900 years between. The Septuagint, even though it's Greek, is 900 years older than the Masoretic, which is usually the base text. So very likely they were all 12 described here. It's interesting that the New Jerusalem, the place that the ultimate end is described in Revelation 21, and the building of the wall of it was as jasper, the city was a pure gold like unto clear glass. Now that confuses me. It's pure gold, but you can see through it. Obviously we're in a hyperspace here, frankly. And the found, I'll talk about that in a, minute, a little later. And the foundation of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth the sardonyx, the sixth the sardius, the seventh the chrysolite, the eighth the beryl, the ninth the topaz, the tenth the chrysop, eleventh the jacinth, and twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, and every gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. There we go again. Transparent gold, I, I, interesting stuff. But if you try to reconcile these precious stones, you'll have a real tough time because the names are not consistently used through the ages involved. Different people use different words. It's very difficult. You're getting a huge headache to try to reconcile those. But he also said, thy tabrets and thy pipes. 
That's uh, uh, tambourines, or it's like holes in a flute is what's being talked about here. This is why many people believe that, he, his, that uh, Lucifer's skill at music was unexcelled. Many people presume that he was the leader of the worship in heaven. His musical skills were unexcelled, apparently. The, the workmanship of these things were prepared in, in, the, in the day that thou was created. He was originally created as the ultimate in wisdom and everything. No, numero uno. Okay? In fact, his job was according to that. It says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Clumsy language in our vocabulary, but pretty straightforward. He's a cherub. That's the super angel category, right? You got angels and you got cher- seraphs and cherubs and all that. He is the anointed cherub. He's the one that's been given the mandate. The, he's the anointed one to run things. The anointed cherub that covereth. He's at the top of the heap. He's the guy running things. That's what that expression is intended to convey. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And God speaking, I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. The mountain in prophecy idiomatically is a government. Remember, uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar himself explains that for us in, in uh, Daniel 4 and elsewhere. The mountain of God. And also in Daniel 2. The mountain that fills the whole earth and so on. I have set thee so. Thou wast the, uh, upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. I assume that's a good thing. Hmm? Okay. Super angels. I know they're all through the scripture. Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 1 and 10 and on it goes. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, comma. Let's absorb that. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. And then we have the saddest word in the scripture. Till. Iniquity was found in thee. Christ, by the way, was the one that created him. By him were all things made that were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. He was perfect Till iniquity was found in thee. So let's first of all realize Satan, even with all his power, is still only a created being. The warfare that's going on is not between Christ, uh, between God or Christ and Satan. Because that's no contest. The mystery we want to unravel is why didn't God just snuff him out? Why did he let this play? Because he, he had an agenda. And Satan's going to inadvertently Fulfill God's agenda here. Okay. Till iniquity was found in thee. That's the sad part. So first of all, let's summarize. Ezekiel described a king in terms that could not apply to a mere man. He he appeared in the Garden of Eden, verse 13. He had been a guardian cherub over it all in verse 14. He possessed free access to God's holy mountain in verse 14. He had been sinless from the time he was created until this event. But then it continues, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. He may have access, but he's no longer there. He's not part of the establishment. He's driven out of the place of sanctity, according to this verse, which he previously occupied, and Psalm 89 deals with that too. And here's the crux of it. Thy heart, thine heart, was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. His heart was lifted up. Pride. This is why God hates pride. Because it was through pride that sin enters the environment. God can, thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries. See, apparently he ran the worship. He was the top priest there. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Again, the earth is the stage that this whole drama is going to play out in. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. That's Isaiah 28, excuse me, Ezekiel 28. A parallel passage, very similar, is in Isaiah 14. 
Not Tyrus now, it's Babylon. But the writer, it's going to be a lamentation on the king of, Ty- of Babylon. And again, it's not talking to the actual king, it's talking to the power that's behind the king. Starting about verse 12, Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Who? Fallen from heaven, Lucifer? That was his original name. Nachash in the Hebrew, the bright shining one, also meaning a serpent, the Latin being Lucifer. But he could then we have the famous five I wills, starting at verse 13. God speaking, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. His conceit, his arrogance, as he felt that he had what it took to be like God himself. That's called rebellion. That's called disaster. Disaster. And it's interesting that God didn't just snuff him out. No, he's going to play this out to show you where all this leads. He's letting this play out to show where it leads. There can only be one will in the universe. And it's the Messiah's job to bring that all together. God, can you, that yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. When did Satan destroy the cities? Doesn't that sound like Jeremiah 4 that we just read? A judgment of some kind that happened we don't have a record of, that made the world as a wilderness, that destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? What's that talking about? Heavy stuff coming down here. When did this happen? Take another look when you get a chance at Jeremiah 4, verses 23 to 26. See what you think. Let's continue here. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Boy, that's graphic. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial because thou hast destroyed thy land. Whose land? His land. Interesting. Thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. That I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains tread him underfoot and shall his yoke depart from off of them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. Did you catch that? The Syrian. The Antichrist is not a Western European. He's an Assyrian. So says Michael 5. Micah 5. So has Isaiah 10 and a number of other passages. He's an Assyrian. Nimrod was an Assyrian. The final world dictator will be an Assyrian. Scripture makes that pretty clear, interestingly enough. we go through that some other time. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. This is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall annul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? I always think of Yule Brimmer. So shall it be written, so shall it be done. (laughs) Okay. That's the origin of evil. The, The usurpation, the rebellion of the top angel who becomes... Hasatan, Satan, our accuser, our tempter. Our warfare, the warfare is not between God and Satan. That's no contest. That, would, that, 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 that contest would last about uh, uh, less than a nanosecond. No, it serves God's purpose to demonstrate that even though Satan was successful at getting man to abort his allegiance to the God of the universe, he was unsuccessful at getting man subject to him. So the first problem, there was one will in the universe. I mean, after God, there was a second will in the universe, Lucifer's, and his shenanigans ended up creating millions of wills in the universe. 
So, we're, they're, they're, so Satan's in the, is, is, I always think of these things where like a, a guy on horseback trying to herd kittens. You know, you've seen those things. So in our next session, we're going to talk a little bit about this unseen world that we're dealing with. And we're going to talk about the nature of the cosmic warfare that you and I are engaged in. Whether we like it or not, we're there. We are both pawns in this warfare and we're also the prize in this warfare. We want to understand that. And we want to understand, at least a little bit, of our resources. And we'll take that up in the next hour.